one book. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. One chapter. For the one who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. One verse at a time. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We're in it. Genesis 22, I'll be reading from the NAS translation. Hear the words of the Lord. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son, he said. Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself for the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And when they had come to the place which God had told them, and Abraham had built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and had laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For I, know, I now know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. In the mount of it, the Lord will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing, and you have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have observed my voice and obeyed. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. So is the word of the Lord. Thank you for that. Um, this is a, uh, I don't know, I don't know, a tough passage. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. It's a great passage. Uh, there's a lot that's happening um, here. It's striking, if we're being honest. This, uh, this passage really snaps the neck and gets your attention and makes you think, well, what, what, is, what is going on here? Why, why, would, why would the Lord command such a thing? Um, and so I want to dig into that, but I want to start uh, with three verses, three, three verses outside of our text here. 
Um, I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll, we'll go there. I don't want anybody to sprain a finger trying to keep up. It's, uh, first will be Psalm 139. We'll look at Psalm 139. We'll be in, in a few verses there. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to look at Psalm 33. So Psalm 139, Isaiah 40, and Psalm 33. Um, and again, this is, we're going to get some perspective on who God is. And this is going to be helpful as we study the text. Psalm 139, verses 2 through 4. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. There's a wonderful perspective on who God is and who we are. We think we're complicated, but we're very knowable to an all-knowing God. Now to Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and make him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding. This speaks of the impassibility, the complexity of the Lord. He doesn't seek counsel from us. He doesn't learn from us. I think Pastor John has mentioned a few times, God is not a watchmaker. He doesn't wind everything up and then let it play out on its own and learn what's going to happen. He doesn't adjust his plan as he goes. This is the God of the book of Genesis in chapter 3 who had the proto-evangelion, the the pre-gospel, who already proclaimed what would happen in the end with the Satan who caused the fall in the garden. He doesn't seek counsel. His ways are holy and perfect. And good. And finally, Psalm 33, verses 13 through 15. Psalm 33, 13 through 15. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. God is omniscient, meaning all-knowing. He's omnipresent, meaning he's, he's essentially at all places, all at the same time, if you will. He looks down from heaven. He sees the children of man. He's involved. He's engaged. He knows what's happening in people's lives. He's not detached. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes their deeds. These are the truths, the kinds of truths that Abraham is learning learning and has learned about God up to this point. And we've seen this incredible trajectory in Abraham's life as he was, he was called out of the land of his upbringing and then sojourning where God would tell him to go, trusting God by faith, learning how to follow after God. And so it's very important as we come to the the passage this morning, which is so attention-grabbing, almost heart-wrenching in a sense. If If you really engage yourself in the story and don't just read it as though it's some piece of fiction that's supposed to be interesting, this is real life. This is playing out in people's lives. This is this is gut-wrenching. I can't imagine hearing such a thing. And so there's a twofold reason for what is happening here with Abraham. With the perspective that we just got, which is a slight glimpse into who God is, we ask then, why does God test? What is the reason for testing? In Abraham, I think we'll see a twofold reason. One is going to be unique to Abraham and God's purposes in him, and we'll talk about that today. 
So there is certainly some uniqueness here to Abraham. Please do not think that you're being called to this, though parents sometimes think maybe they are. But there is a second portion of this that is common for the testing of God's children, those who are found in Christ, those who are God's own by adoption. And so we'll talk about that before we move into the text, because it's, it's helpful background for reading this text and understanding this text, but also it's important to the Christian life. And it's all relevant to this story of Abraham. I mean, we should always ask if the word is God's word and it's all that we need for righteousness, for training in righteousness, for, for life, for godliness, why has God made it so that this particular story would not only play out, but would be recorded in the scripture for us? There's always a reason. And so Abraham's testing here exposes us to a, a greater narrative about God's own son. And there's hints all throughout that passage that we read that there are, there are echoes and shadows that are pointing forward to Christ all over this passage. The very Christ, the very only son, the preeminent son who would be sacrificed as an offering for sin, that final perfect lamb who would say it is finished. And so Abraham's story then is this attention-demanding demonstration of God's own sacrifice for us. This is the point. It's almost as if the, the, the knife of sacrifice passes from Abraham to be picked up in the future by God in the truth that we live in today as we think about Christ. And so that part is unique to Abraham. That is not something that we are called to be a part of. It's something that we're called to see, that we're called to learn from, and that we're called to take instruction from. We, we get a deeper understanding about God's own sacrifice here in Christ. But there is a shared nature of testing that is true for the Christian. And so we'll look in the book of James to get some more perspective on that. The first chapter of James talks about the very reason for testing in the third and fourth verse. So James 1, 3, and 4. Um, always good to, to be able to pop around the, the scriptures, to understand the scriptures. Sometimes, as we'll see today in the book of Hebrews, it provides us with commentary on what was happening with the story of Abraham. Here in the book of James, it provides us background on, well, what is testing? And we see that certainly Abraham is in the midst of a test here. So James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's what testing is for you. It's for your perfection. It's so that you would lack nothing. That's what James says testing does. He says it produces, the ESV would say, steadfastness. NASB would say endurance. NIV, LSB would say perseverance. They're getting at this idea of a, of a, a faith that grows and continually can bear more weight of life. Because if you've been around for a few years, you know that this life tends to pile up on us. It doesn't tend to, to let up. Um, it doesn't tend to leave us alone. It continues to go after us. And sometimes for the believer, um, if we allow it, life can really pile up. You, you can look around and be frustrated. We see the psalmist lamenting that all over the place. Why, it seems like the, the wicked and the ungodly do so well. But the psalmist says their feet are on a slippery slope, and we know that their end is death. But for the Christian, Death has no sting. Death is gain, Paul would say. To be absent from the body is to be present with God. What a wonderful encouragement for the believer who's found in Christ. To leave this body behind will be my greatest joy. Um, the, uh, absolute greatest joy. That's why funerals are always so bittersweet. We miss the person who's gone. But for the believer, my goodness, what they now know is incredible. 
I mean, could you imagine to actually hear the words, well done, good, and faithful servant? I want for that. I want that for you. I want that for me a lot. The alternative is grim. And so Abraham, through testing, learns a lot about God, but it's over time. The story didn't just start. We're in this 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis, which has covered everything from creation to the flood to the fall, not to the fall from the flood, the flood. Abraham has lived a lot of life and walked with God before we get to this point. We see in the, in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, God commands Abraham, Abram at this point to leave his land and become a sojourner. In 12.7, we see that God appears to him when he entered Canaan's land. 12.10 through 20, we see God afflicting Pharaoh and his house with plagues because of Abram's wife. This story will replay itself again later. But the ruler recognized that Abraham is somehow special to God in Genesis 12, 10 through 20. God comes to Abraham again in Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 and 18, and makes promises to him. He visits him in Genesis 15 and makes a covenant with him. He changes his name. In Genesis 17, there's a promise for a seed from Sarah and Isaac child that they will have even in their advanced years. God visits Abraham in the Oaks of Mamre. We see God laying plagues on Abimelech's household, declaring Abraham to be a prophet, leaving Abraham behind to pray for them so that he could relieve the plagues. And then Abraham becoming blessed after all of this. I mean, God has taken such special care and given such wonderful provision to Abraham. His faith wasn't amazing from the beginning. It was grown over time through testing by God. I think sometimes we think of testing like school. Some of you ever think of a scantron. It's because you're old. And I don't think they do that anymore. You think of testing where you're passing or you're failing, or they tell you if you're doing well or not doing well. This is not the way that God, the, the, the word describes the testing that God is doing. He's not seeing what's going to happen with you. Remember everything that we've just learned about God. He's all-knowing. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. The concept of biblical testing isn't to see if you're able to muster up enough self-discipline to avoid something. It's to grow your faith. It pits some understanding about God from the word against some situation. And as you endure, as you live through that, as you honor God through that, you grow. Because you can look back, if you've been a Christian for a little bit, you can look back on your life and think about seasons and times where God saw you through. Or where perhaps you, not that you would do this, but perhaps you in some way doubted God. Not that you would say that, perhaps, out loud. But maybe you did. Maybe you wonder, God, can you really see me through this moment? And to see him have done exactly that, to see himself show himself strong, to see himself be your advocate, to understand that you grew through that is such a wonderful encouragement over the years. That's testing. That's what James describes as making us perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. It's growth, it's sanctification, and it comes over time, and it comes through testing. And sometimes it's, it's burdensome trial, other times, it's just daily life situations, and you look back and you survey the history. Um, said before, I, I love charts. I like pie charts with bars and bar charts with pie. And if you made two charts and you laid them on top of each other, and one was trial and testing, and the other was spiritual growth, I think you would find common peaks. We tend to grow when the cranks and the pressure is on. When the, when the refiner's fire is spinning up and the dross rises to the surface and it's scraped off and it's discarded and more purified substance is left behind, this is at times the Christian life. The call is not to live a, an easy life per se, but again, I don't want to leave you behind with a perspective of, of, of drudgery and dragging one leg behind and 
Sometimes we can get into the, uh, we can fall into the rut. We can fall into the error of constantly complaining about how hard our life is. That's not really how Jesus describes it. And so we just looked at nine passages from Genesis 12 through Genesis 21 where Abraham encountered God, heard from God, learned about God through times of, of, of testing that have produced faith, that have produced steadfastness, that have begun to have their full effects. And now we come to Genesis chapter 22 when this incredible test comes about for Abraham. Verse 22, or chapter 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Abraham, who's been visited by God on lots of occasions, really, by, by this point, whose, whose faith has been tested and consistent with James, has been, been growing. His steadfastness has been growing. We've made several notes of that as we've gone along. We've seen Abraham act differently in different circumstances. It seems um, the last time that he was in front of uh, Abimelech, the ruler, instead of being a man who's, who's terrified and afraid of power structures, he's a man who's been encouraged that God is with him and God is going to see him through. And uh, Abimelech lays out this pact that he wants to make. Abraham says, sure, I'll sign up for that. However, your men have taken my well over. And so he's not afraid to stand on his own. He seems to be growing a bit and trusting God. This is the product of a tested faith, consistent with what James would come to say later about steadfastness. He has grown from being a man fearful of Pharaoh, who, a man who maybe even, in a sense, spoke back to God in Genesis chapter 19, asking if he would destroy the righteous of Sodom. Abraham learned through that situation as well, that God was righteous, that God was just in all that he has done. Abraham is learning to trust every aspect about God because we, we can't forget that Abraham is, is a patriarch. He's part of the cloud of witnesses that the book of Hebrews will talk about that are supposed to encourage us. He doesn't have the full text that we have. He can't go reference Psalms and understand more about God. He learns through experience and God by his grace visits him and allows him to grow over time. And now Abraham is ready to stand this test. He responds, here I am. He has learned to hear from God. He has learned to trust God's intentions. And he has learned to follow God in faith. This has all been learned. Abraham didn't land in this place on day one. It came through testing. It came through experience, and it came from learning to trust God. Um, now, we have this wonderful, wonderful 66-book text that we can come to trust God through as we understand that it is internally consistent, that it is without error, that it has spoken about Christ since day one, that we get to see the, the full revealed character and nature of God. We get to see him consistently through all of these stories that he is allowed to play out through people who were just like us. And then we get to see the difference that the God-man, fully God, fully man, living in the same life as us, tested and tried and tempted and always like us, but without ever sinning. We get to see all of that. That is such an incredible blessing. And we should benefit from being able to read of all of these tests. We should benefit from seeing the faith of the patriarchs, as Hebrews talks about the cloud of witness, which we'll look at. But Abraham learned, he learned to hear from God, he learned to trust God's intentions, and he learned to follow God in faith. Verse 2, he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Now, we demonstrated across those nine occasions, just the nine that I captured, I'm sure there are others, where the mighty God of Abraham causes his will to pass. And Abraham now knows who God is. I mean, some of the circumstances that Abraham was in were near impossible and dire, dire straits. And God sees him through it exactly the way he said he would, up to and including um, having a, a child at such advanced years, when they had decided to go a complete 
different direction with this handmaiden, which is why it's interesting that he says, your only son, right? Maybe your ear caught that, and we'll talk about that. Well, let's look to some, um, some, some biblical commentary on this. We'll be in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, um, because this text will note that Abraham knew that God would fulfill his promise and make a nation through himself and his wife, Sarah, through Isaac. So what a strange juxtaposition. He was just told to offer him up as an offering. But Abraham, by faith, understood that somehow this nation would come through Isaac. He had seen God do the near impossible, and so he trusts by faith. Here I am, Lord. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was even able to rise him from the dead, which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So you see, Abraham's faith knew that the promise was coming through Isaac, and he trusted God with that wholly. He didn't know how it was going to work, but certainly he had seen God work the impossible previously, even with Isaac's existence to begin with. So he responds by faith with, here I am. Isaac was the only begotten son. Um, Begotten means set aside, different, special. That's what the text says, that Isaac was the only begotten son. He was this different son in the same way that Christ is the only begotten. And you see in John 3, 16, certainly God has many sons, right, through adoption, but Christ is special. He is preeminent. And so Isaac is the, is the same way. He is the preeminent son, the one that is loved, the one through whom the promise comes. He says to offer him up, the only begotten son, the unique and special one, the promised one. So Abraham rose early in the morning, verse 3, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. This is absolutely shocking. He has been told to offer his son up. He goes to cut wood. He gets a donkey to carry all of the equipment. He brings a couple of people with him, maybe some trusted servants, and off they go on a journey that we're going to see is going to be about a three-day journey. On a three-day journey, just in faith and in obedience and to the direct call of God, he's ready to pick up a few things and take a three-day trip. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to venture very far away from my home at all. I get slightly grumpy when I have to leave my house, in fact. I am a hermit. He's willing to pick up, load up an animal, go on a three-day trek with his son that he absolutely treasures and loves, and perhaps what he thinks is his second or third face in life here, ready to settle down a bit, and know he's going to go offer this boy up as an offering. Imagine the things that must be going through his mind, what he's about to have to do. But there's some things that he's learned about God along the way. And he trusts God completely with this situation. He is the father of faith. And this isn't a normative story. I mean, this isn't something that you should expect to happen in your own life. If you think you're hearing from God directly, then it better be because you're reading from this. And if you hear his voice, it should be because you're reading it out loud. Otherwise, it's almost completely not real, and you need pills. This is different. This is what we have. This is God's revelation to us. It is finished. It is closed. It is set. There are 66 books. Not anymore. This is what God has said. This is what has been revealed. But Abraham is different. He's the father of faith. In fact, he's a, he's a patriarch. He's the first patriarch. He is specifically named all over Scripture. And, and Jesus would say, I can make 
children from him out of these rocks. He has built his trust and then ultimately his faith from seeing God deliver and knowing God's goodness and his power. He understands that God is good. Again, he learned a lot from the instance at Sodom and Gomorrah. He learned of God's justice. This was not a town of righteous people. There weren't many. What God did was grace-filled. He has learned through experience the truth that we read of in Numbers 23. Don't have to flip there. You can. It's your life. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Gosh, we would do well to sink that truth deeply. God is not a man that he would lie or son of man, that he would change his mind. He doesn't even change his mind. Why would he? He's all-knowing. What information is he going to receive that causes him to now go a different direction? What is it that he is learning where he would say, oh, actually, I was wrong. The sovereign, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present, God of all creation has been corrected by his creatures who are dust, piled up and animated by his own breath. Verse four, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So they were where God called him, a several day journey away. And Abraham believed God in his ability to see through his will. There may be in what we would call the old city of Jerusalem today. We'll see that in a bit. Not to be missed, at the very end of this verse is something important that yet again hints towards Abraham's trust and his unflappable confidence in the word of God. He is completely confident in God's word, which is important. He says, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Tells him we're coming back. He doesn't know how this is going to work out. Perhaps he thinks it's through some kind of a resurrection, but he knows that they're coming back. He knows that this is not final because there are unfinished promises that God has made through this boy that he is going to offer up and he trusts God with, his, with everything that he has to see through his promises. Why? Because God is not like a man that he should lie or change his mind. If he has said it, it will be. He told him, you're going to have a son with your wife and they said, we're gonna go another direction. God comes back and says, no, you're gonna have a son with your wife and they do. He brings him into impossible circumstances. I mean, I don't think we quite understand the weight of encountering a Pharaoh, thinking that you're in absolute peril and watching God come in and plague this community of people and then see you through and allow you to be released. And now you have passage and right to the land. This is huge. God shows himself as incredibly strong and that builds Abraham's faith. He's the same God today. Sometimes we forget that, right? We don't hear from him directly. He's not whispering to you in your bed. Again, if you think he is, he is not. We hear from him in his word, but we should have the same unflappable confidence that Abraham had. The same word. We get to see everything that happened to Abraham and everything else. How much more confident in God should we be knowing this word? Would we really think that we would live according to the will of God and something would go wrong? What's the worst that can happen? It would take your life? Remember, we said, to be absent from the body is to be present with God. Is this place so great? Um, I would encourage you that it is not so great, this place. You're maybe used to it, but it's not so great. 
So they go on this journey, this several day journey, they end up where they're supposed to go and Abraham says, be right back. Verse six, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and lay it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb for burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. The tension in this story is almost unbearably difficult to read when you, you think about what is really occurring here. This is powerful. And this is not to be blushed over. This is not to smooth the edges off and say, well, God really didn't want him to do that. So frequently, we try to make God palatable by rubbing the edges off of something that he put the edges on. This is his word. If it's rubbing you the wrong way, then you try to understand why. why. Why would it be that way? Why would God preserve it so that the story would be so rough? Maybe it's supposed to be rough. Maybe it's supposed to be unsettling. Maybe you're not supposed to come away from this with a mouthful of cotton candy and a little fatter and happier. Maybe this is supposed to upset you. I would submit that it's supposed to draw our mind forward to the great and deep sacrifice of God himself for punishing your sin on his son, Christ. And to build our confidence through Abraham. Verse 9, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and lay him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. The man of faith consistently answers, here I am. I'm going to pause here and say, as we noted earlier, Abraham is a patriarch, a father of the faith. In the cloud of witnesses that is, is designed to encourage our faith. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 encourages us that that's exactly what these patriarchs are supposed to do. They're supposed to encourage our faith. And he hears from God directly. And we don't in the same way. We have the whole counsel of God's word. He's not coming to us and giving us fresh revelation. He doesn't need to. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says that we've been given everything that we need for life and godliness. No one needs to come to you and tell you something that they've heard from the Lord. If they've heard something from the Lord, it better have chapter and verse attached to it, or you should warn them. And why am I harping on this? I visited a church in town when I first came here um, by happenstance. I wouldn't have gone there myself. Someone just invited me, and so I went. And there was a coffee shop. And so I went to the coffee shop, and I'm, you know, pumping, a, pumping on the old cauldron there, getting some coffee. And the man comes up to me and he says, oh, well, it looks like uh, it's going to snow today. I said, okay. And he said, well, not that I'm prophesying. I said, well, that's good, because you know what the Bible says about a prophet whose prophecy doesn't come true. And he had no laugh or really didn't seem to have any information about what the Bible says about a prophet whose prophecy doesn't come true. And I thought, where am I? There's a lot of where am I places around here. Um, I, I was absolutely stunned as we visited uh, some of the churches that were here of what kind of filthy garbage trash part passes for church. Um, and, and I don't say that lightly. I find it embarrassing, frankly. The word is so crystal clear, you have to desire to do something else with it than to present it truly. Uh, you have to be 
twisted, you have to have a twisted moral compass and desire for your own gain to do something else with this word. And it's done so frequently. It's designed to prop up social structures. Half of the churches are just, just about as good as the Lions Club, just a place to network and do business. Uh, the other half are just creating salaries and making a place for people to feel good and have outlet for their things. So they have horse ministry and car stereo system ministry. And basically, whatever you already enjoy with ministry written after it. I say that so that you'll be discerning and, and cautious because we're not in an idle world. We're in one that hates God. And what even masquerade is the very church for which Christ died in order to capture you and get your attention. God has reached us through his recorded word. And so what we see in Abraham then is a perseverance that is growing through testing, but it's centered around the word of God. It's still centered around the word. It's not that Abraham is, is picking up his, his beautifully bound premium LSV and reading. He's a patriarch. He is receiving direct revelation from God. And so he's hearing that revelation. He's hearing the word from God and he's trusting it. And that's accounted to him as faith. Remember, that's the opposite of what happened in the garden. God said, you may eat from anything, but not this. Satan came in and said, well, did God really say? And so Satan twisted God's word, made people doubt God's word from the very beginning. This was the fall, was not trusting the word of God. How we understand this matters. And we shouldn't come to it flippantly and just make up what we think it says or lay over top of it some understanding about it that really serves to benefit us. There's warning all over scripture about the fact that that absolutely will happen. People will do this for selfish gain. And we think that that must mean that they are doing it for money. They might not be. They might be doing it for local popularity. They might be doing it so that people will follow them around and think they're interesting. They behave more as shamans than pastors. If you have a pastor who delivers a message about what you should know, and it's not from scripture, then you should run from that. It's garbage. It has nothing to do with God. We have the whole council and it's all we need. And it should encourage our own perseverance. Following Abraham, verse 12, he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thickets by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Abraham, by faith, knew that God would in some way provide. He didn't know the details. But in the nine steadfast, persevering tests that we mapped out earlier, he knew that God was faithful to his promises. He understood that about God. He knew that Isaac was one of those promises. And he knew that there were future promises in Isaac that had clearly not played out yet. And so Isaac would somehow come through this, even if it required a resurrection. And isn't that interesting that that concept would be in Abraham's mind? Think about that. Hebrews tells us it was. So this scene then plays out for Abraham to grow his faith and for Isaac to grow his faith, but also for us to have this cloud of witness, to have our own faith bolstered as we look at this scene and grow together with Abraham because the Lord will provide. And so that's Mount Moriah, hotly contested spot. If you've been there, um, Muslim people, long time ago, build their own kind of a temple there and play loud music, and there's a gold you know, dome sitting on top of it. It's where David built a threshing floor. If you look at 2 Samuel 24, 
Um, it's where the uh, first and, and the second temple was. It's where the Wailing Wall is today. If you go to Jerusalem, you'll see the Wailing Wall. This is the same location. And, and uh, Daniel 9 would demonstrate that this is where the third temple will be rebuilt. How are you going to do that? Right? It's hotly contested. Don't know, but we look at the cloud of witnesses and we look at all that God has done. Leading a people out of uh, slavery, followed by a national army, he opens the water and drowns them. We just trust that God's going to do it. Just like Abraham trusted that somehow Isaac would live through this situation. By faith, we know that God is more powerful than any power structure we could ever face. And we almost walk, away, walk around with an unfair edge. If we're in God's will, we're exactly in the pocket that we want to be. And we trust him with everything. If it means our utter destruction, then that's fine because we'll just die and then we'll be present with God forever because we're found in Christ. There is no sting to death and that's the worst thing that can happen to us. Verse 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and they went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. As is the pattern with Abraham. He's tested by God, reassured of the promises, often with increasing clarity. Abraham's dependence will be as the stars of the heaven and the sand of the seashore. Sand of the seashore. Possessing the gate of your enemies and being blessed because of Abraham's obedience. How amazing is that? Abraham's faith is so great because it's grown by God over time. It really is a story about God. Abraham didn't jump up out of the womb with this faith. God encouraged it forward in him through tests. And they weren't tests so that Abraham could see what would happen. Or excuse me, they weren't tests so that God could see what would happen. They were tests for Abraham's benefit. Right? It's like gift giving. When you're the gift giver and you wrap something up and you hand it to someone, you're not learning what's in it. You're enjoying this person. Watch what's in it. Discover what's in it. That's the fun part is watching that person see what's in there. Now, when we have the Holy Spirit come to reside in us and give us spiritual gifts and all kinds of things, our lives can be like that as well as we discover what God is doing in us. So I, I don't like the idea of some kind of a spiritual gifts inventory. Take one of those, crumple the paper up, and put it somewhere else. That talks about the things you already like, right? You know, it's like you're, you're an administrator at the office, and you take a spiritual gifts inventory, and it says your gift is administration. I mean, imagine that. What a bummer. I wanted something cool, you know, like nap. Uh, listen, powerful spiritual gift in this one for the nap. The 30-minute power nap, call me around 3. I probably won't answer. You know why? I'm asleep. God allows us to have these gifts so that we'll see him working in us. You'll see something that's not natural of you. You'll experience some situation or something that happens, and you'll say, my gosh, look, that's God at work in me. I'm not like this. Maybe it's a moment where you have patience with someone, and you say, well, that doesn't flow out of me. That's incredible. Look at God showing off. What a blessing to know that God's at work in you. And that's a wonderful thing about the, the, the body. Right? The body will help you see, and when I say the body, I mean all of us together, right? will help you see when God is doing things in your life. Sometimes they'll remind you that perhaps you're being a little surly, and the body will be used to grow you and to stretch you. Sometimes they'll say, hey, I've noticed this about you. It looks like you're really growing in this area, and you won't have noticed it. Right? It's like people in your house. You know, It's like being a kid is the worst thing because you know what's going to happen when you come to an environment you haven't been in in a while. They'll say, oh my gosh, you grew. Like this is some amazing thing that never happens. You're like, yes, I did. I'm not a baby anymore. Sorry to the people I did that to today. 
And so Abraham, his faith is so great because of God. It's a story about God. Um, quickly, I want to read a couple of, uh, a couple of warnings. I, I, I talked a little bit about uh, the world that we're in and the importance of recognizing that the word that we have is finished and the word that we have is everything that we need for life, reproof, godliness, uh, training in righteousness. Um, but the world that we live in is not passive. It is not mute. It is not just excitedly waiting to see what, the, what wonderful thing the Christian will do next. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 issues a warning. It says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it was received with thanksgiving. For it is made by the holy word of God and prayer. It is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Strong warnings. Spirit expressly says in latter times, some will depart from the faith by the devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Boy, if that's not enough to make you pay attention to what you're listening to. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Now, this concept of the seared conscience is, is, is very important because I find that to be a warning to myself because you know what that means? The conscience can be seared. That means when you ignore the Holy Spirit, whose ministry in us is to remind us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, when you remind long, or excuse me, when you ignore long enough, you lose sensitivity. And that's scary. We need to keep short account with sin. When, when, when we feel the ministry of the Holy Spirit welling up, perhaps you're, you know, just to think of some top ahead examples, perhaps you were like really rude to someone, you know, like, I need to go talk to that person. I don't know what's going on in their life, but I need to just take opportunity to apologize. Maybe they're a believer or an unbeliever, it doesn't matter. Take that opportunity, keep short account. Another good warning from the word, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But false prophets are also among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality because of the way the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed... They will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not sleep. I bring this out to say that pastorally, for Pastor John Nicholas, for myself, we have a deep burden for every single one of you, a deep and personal burden. Now, I will tell you, I know when you've moved seats. I know when you usually sit there, I know that you are usually here. And you know why? Because I go through the room and I pray in my mind where everybody was sitting. And we are, John and I are scripturally commanded to be that way. We're extolled. And if you want to look at these, look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 on your own. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. There are many places where the pastor is called to care specifically for the people in their flock. Why do I bring that out? Because part of our job is to guard the flock. That means if we're standing out, you know, to kind of follow the flock metaphor, if we're standing out, we're looking at a pasture, and we see a, a ravenous wolf over here, and everybody says, gee, I would really like it over there. We would say, no, we're not going to go there as a matter of guarding. There are people who will say things to you, perhaps, without any caution or regard for you. They have no scriptural mandate to care for you. Perhaps they will say biblical-sounding things that maybe are hurtful to you, but they have 
no call or no mandate to care for your soul. And that's why we have to be cautious because we live in a hyper-connected world. We, we live in a world where there is just constant teaching being pumped into our ears. You might be mowing the grass and listening to someone else's Bible study. You might be driving in your car listening to someone teach you from the, from the Bible. And we're just constantly getting full and full and just fat and crammed full of milk with spit up flowing out of our mouth all the time and chunks on our shirts. We don't even know what we're saying. We're just saying truths that other people have cooked up and we don't even know if it's real. But having no concern for the spiritual health of others and barfing up someone else's conclusions is frankly at times incredibly dangerous to people. James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man able to bridle his whole body. James will go on to talk about the tongue and being careful. The tongue has the power to control an entire ship. And so what we say if we're discautious can be dangerous and hurtful to people. I say this because Abraham's faith grew because of his obedience to God and to his word, not through obedience to fast-mouthed babblers who challenged his faith and had zero care for him. In the beginning, we said there are two reasons for Abraham's testing. One was unique to Abraham and God's purposes for him. The other was common among God's children. We are tested to trust the, the word and grow in our faith. And, and we can expect that. We can expect opportunities for that. We can expect opportunities to trust God in his word and to grow through that. Um, there, there's a wonderful perspective in the book of Job. He has these friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophor. Name your kids that, and you get extra points from First Reform. You get a free coffee cup if you use Eliphaz, Bildad, or Zophor. Never too late for Zophor Nicholas, by the way. Z-N. These guys were giving great sounding advice, right? Job, all this terrible stuff is happening to you. It's probably God is doing something to you because of some secret sin in your life. But it wasn't true. It's not what was going on at all. They said things that sounded biblical, but they were just doing damage to their friend. They were just running their mouth. They were saying things that other people were saying. They had no deep care for Job. And when you read the book of Job, you see that something else altogether was happening. God was doing something. And they were a part of that, but not in the way that they wanted to be, probably. And so for us, it is important to be like a Berean. Um, if that's a new reference to you, Paul said he went to the people, the Bereans, the people in Berea, and he taught. And what did they do? They took it, and they compared it to the word to see if it was so. They would take what he would teach, and then they would quietly go off, and they would compare it to the word to see if it was so. I didn't say they compared it to their feelings. I didn't say they compared it to Steve Lawson's study last week to see if it was so. They said they compared it to the word. They did their own research. They dug in, and that's the point. The point is to go here. If you're just listening to podcasts and other people, and you're not going here, turn them off. I'll tell you, I listen to net zero teachings all week. That's how many I listen to is none. And I do that for my own good because I can start to pick up on other people's characteristics and mannerisms, and I might miss a nuance that they were presenting that I wasn't aware of, and that doesn't help us. And so we have to be cautious with that as well as we're talking with the people around us. We can't just pass off some understanding that someone else had that they delivered to their flock that wasn't for you or for us. We have to be more careful than that. Remember, teachers are judged with a more strict measure. So I just I beg of us to be careful who we soak up. Read Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus is scathing rebuke in Matthew 23 of those tying up burdens that were heavy for other people to bear. God tests our faith, not our discipline. What a legalist will give you is a test of your faith that's based on your ability to do hard things. And they might deadpan that. They might say, well, you just need to be doing this. And really, all they're doing is giving you scriptural spit up 
from a full-bellied baby who's just been piling on teaching after teaching that they don't even understand what it said. And they might not have any care for you whatsoever. And so if you're concerned with what you're hearing, I want you to talk to a pastor here or a deacon here, and we'll help sort that out. We may plug you into trusted discipleship. We may give you something to consider. We probably will pray with you, but we'll walk it out together because that's the mandate and that's the call. And Scripture gives us caution. Acts 20, verses 30 and 31. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Verse 34, therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And so, church, if if you're someone who's speaking twisted things to the flock of this church, you should expect, one, to hear from me soon, and two, to know that I am the least of your worries, but no slight worry, because Matthew chapter 18 and verse 6 says, whoever causes a little one that believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. I want you to be encouraged by Abraham and his faith and his trusting of God in the word and let that grow your own faith in the same. But remember, stay in this word. This is the safe place. Amen? Let's pray. God, we love you so much and we thank you for all that you allow us to learn through Abraham and from Abraham and from that entire great cloud, that wonderful witness that encourages our faith. God, would you do wonderful things in our midst this week? Would you grow us stronger as believers? God, if there would be anyone in the room this morning who does not know you savingly through your son, Jesus, in personal relationship, God, I pray that you cause them this morning to repent and pray the prayer that you hear from the unbeliever, which is, I repent, I turn from my sin, I'm trusting in Christ for everything, and God, would you allow us then to disciple that person and walk with that person. For those of us who have believed for a time, God, would you use the the faith of Abraham to stoke us, to be re-encouraged, and and remember that you're strong, that you're sovereign, that you're all-knowing, that you're omnipresent, that you are the creator of everything that exists, and that you sustain it. God, we thank you for this wonderful truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.